Hey everyone, Rob Berthoff here, and uh, we're just going to jump into the next series of uh, well, the next module in the uh, the series in theological on Bible symbolism. And this one's fun. Um, you know, in this, we're going to talk about how storytelling is used in the Bible, and this is actually continued from my marketing course on storytelling. So if you're already under, you know, aware of that course, if you've already taken that course, or if you understand the power of storytelling and how effective storytelling is, you'll understand why Jesus used stories. We can actually pull from an Indian proverb that reads, tell me a fact and I'll learn, tell me the truth and I'll believe, but tell me a story and it'll live in my heart forever. And, and I think what's beautiful about this is, that, again, like the same way that metaphors were able to really unlock an emotion or, or tie an idea to an emotion, storytelling is the same idea. And so in the Bible, God calls these storytelling, these illustrative stories, as parables. And we read all throughout how examples, how the Gospels, um, in the Gospels, how Jesus spoke in parables, right? Jesus was revealing previously hidden truths as he spoke. Matthew 13, Jesus spoke in parables. He says, I will open my mouth in parables, and I'll utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And this is where it gets really interesting is that God is wanting to reveal things to us. But as we talked about in previous courses, we need to discern the spiritual with spiritual, right? We can't understand what this means in a, in a mindset of ultimately of the world. And so um, God wants us to understand that we are he, why we are here and what his plan is for us. And because of this, he teaches us in parables because he wants us that are, that are seeking for him to find him, right? But those that are not yet there, this, these truths are not going to make sense to them. They're, they're actually going to be discouraging maybe even to them. And he said unto them in Mark 4, 11, unto you, speaking to his people, it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. And we'll find out what the mystery of the kingdom of God is in Revelation. Uh, so highly recommend you take uh, that Revelation course to, to learn what the mystery of the kingdom of God is, but not to leave you hanging. It's the plan of salvation to a large degree. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So those that do not want to discern will not understand. And there's, But there's another reason I'll talk about in a second. But in Matthew 13, Jesus stated why he spoke in parables so that uh, those who he intended to understand would understand, but those that did not would be baffled. Okay. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because they see not, neither do they understand. Now, there were people trying to have Jesus arrested for many reasons. We read in Christ's Object Lessons how uh, there were priests and rabbis and scribes and elders, um, right? These people, who ambitious men who desired ultimately to bring Jesus down because he was, he was calling them vipers, right? Jesus was calling out the hypocrisy. If Jesus was here today, I would, I mean, I would... It would be interesting to see what he would be saying to these TV evangelisms, right? The TV evangelists. Uh, I mean, the Benny Hills of the world and the, I'll, I'm going to stop making names, but the, the point is simply this. I, he, Jesus was doing, was condemning the equivalence of these uh, holy men who then are abusing their place and power, right? Right? He was going to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees, and he was going to you know, the scholars and saying, you don't actually understand what the Bible has to say, and yet you're teaching something, and you don't understand it. Right? Okay. The Savior understood the character of these men, right? And so he presented truths in a way that they could not find anything to bring before him in the Sanhedrin, right? They were trying to bring him up into court, and... And so he would use these parables, um, and, and in ways he was rebuking their hypocrisy and the wicked works of those that occupied these high positions, um, and in, in figurative language, right, clothed in truth, um, but you know, ultimately so cutting of a character that had been spoken in direct enunciation that they would have actually you know not listened to him. And so by them having to try and figure out what he's trying to say, it actually was also a way to to reach their hearts. And it found out that that many who 
were in these groups actually ultimately believed, but because they're trying to figure out what is he trying to say here? And if he had come out and said uh, more directly, um, you know, they would have ultimately, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, shied away from that initially. So what we see here is, um, you know, while he was evading these spies, right, he still made the truth so clear that error was, was being done, right? And so it was the honest in heart were profited by his lessons, right? Divine wisdom, infinite grace, grace were made plain by the things of God's creation. Through nature and the experiences of life, men were taught of God. And the invisible things of him since the creation of the world, we read in the Bible, were perceived through the things which were made even in his everlasting power and divinity, Romans 1.20. So what's interesting is that Jesus used many different parables and themes with the loss of redemption, right? Um, the loss, uh, you know, a lot of things around loss, right? Um, also things around prayer and love and forgiveness and about gardening and husbandry. There's a lot around uh, about seeds and gardening and growing and things like that. So I just love uh, this. If you want to really understood, understand um, some of these parables and, and really how to make the connection between the Bible and the connection in nature, I highly recommend this book, Christ Object Lessons by Ellen White. And in this, she writes, men could learn the unknown through the known. Heavenly things were revealed through the earthly. In Christ's teachings, the unknown was illustrated by the known and divine truths by earthly things, which were the people were more familiar and so uh, ultimately what, what, what we see here is that we need to remember is that all that come to Christ for a clearer knowledge of the truth will receive it. Okay, that's another quote from, from the same book. He will unfold to them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and these mysteries will be understood by the heart that longs to know the truth. This is this idea of us wanting to be married to Jesus, as this idea of us as a church wanting to uh, and, and I'm not talking about one, one particular body of church. I'm talking about us as a, as a collective that want to see Jesus. That is his church, um, it, it, you know, in a, in, a, in a figurative way, okay? And so what's interesting is there's a lot of parables and a lot of storylines around um, meeting the bridegroom, right? Of, about, you know, we can explore one such parable, um, you know, kind of sticking to this, this wedding theme that we had earlier with, um, with the bridegroom um, is, is interesting, you know, so it's, there's a parable in Matthew uh, 25, 13. And, and ultimately, Jesus likens um, being ready to join Jesus in heaven as essentially bridesmaids who are waiting to meet, meet the groom or, or party goers, however you want to look at this. So let's just go verse by verse here. Then the kingdom of God, uh, sorry, kingdom of heaven, um, be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So we see here, we see ten of the same types of people, right? There's, there's ten people. Right, they're all they're all bridegrooms, right? Uh, sorry, um, uh, bridesmaids, right? They're all party uh, virgins. They're they're guests going to this um, to this uh, wedding. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Okay, so now we see a dividing of these. Okay, so they're all the same, but 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 five of them had took lamps and didn't bring any oil, right? So that's foolishness because you know, hey, I need to bring oil with me if I'm going to keep my lamps going over a period of time. But the wise did take oil extra oil with their lamps. So we know that oil, oil is the Holy Spirit. We, we, already, we already uncovered that in the previous chapter. So, so it could be considered the character of Jesus, right? So if we have that relationship with Jesus or not is the question. And uh, let's read on. While the bridegroom tarried, all that slumbered and uh, all slumbered and slept. So this is interesting that, that everybody waiting for Jesus is sleeping and that means that the state that we're in right now is actually a state of sleep. And Jesus is calling us to wake up out of this state. And I believe that there's going to be a revival soon. And we are going to you know, hear the knocking of Jesus' return. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Right? And this is that wake-up call that happens right before Jesus returns. And there will be, you know, everyone will be awakened from this. Right? We read here, and the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So everybody woke up and they said, okay, I've got to get my lamp ready because, you know, I'm ready to go in. I've got to get my character ready because Jesus is coming and I need to meet him in a place that he won't be ashamed of to, 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 to greet me, right? But when this revival happens, we find that some of them, um, they didn't have the extra oil. They didn't have this. And, they, and the foolish said unto the wise, give us your oil for our lamps have gone out. 
right? But the wise answered saying, not so, lest we, we don't have enough for you. Like we, we can't give you us in our own, right? But rather go and, and find, go to the Bible and, and search it for yourselves. Like you've got to go back and, and look for yourselves and buy that oil for yourself. Create that relationship with God on your own. I can't give you a relationship with God, ultimately, right? Those without a relationship with Jesus who have not that personal and intimate relationship with Jesus will be frantically trying to ask those that, that are connected, right? I see that you're praying. I see that you, you know, teach me to pray like that. And, 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 and ultimately, there won't be time. We all need to have an individual relationship with Jesus now so that when he comes, you know, and, and I've, I've seen, like, I've had this, like, I do a lot of Bible studies and stuff like this. And, and sometimes, like, you know, the week gets ahead of me and, you know, uh, gets away from me, I should say. And, um, you know, I'm like, oh, man, I've got to get a Bible study on this topic. Like, okay, let me just, let me just see what it has to say. Let me just see, you know. And, and it's like as if I'm reading something that's in a different language, right? If we try to rush things, we try to just, like, let me just, I just need to force this relationship to happen, right? It, do, it, it, it doesn't happen, like any relationship, it needs to happen over time. Um, and so when I start early and I say, okay, I've got to, I've got to you know, let's just say I've got to study on, on Friday. I'm going to start on Monday. And, you know, I go to God and I, and I build that relationship. It's like he unlocks it all for me. And then it's just so easy. Um, but we've got to start early. We read in that same book, Christ Object Lessons, that in the parable, all had uh, lamps and vessels for oil. For there was a time, uh, for a time, there was no, there was seen no difference between them. So the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, all will have knowledge of the scriptures, all will have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now, a time of waiting intervenes, faith is tried, and when the cry is heard, many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. They're destitute of the character of Christ, of the relationship with Christ. And they went to buy, and the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went into the marriage. But those that were not, right, they'd been caught off guard, right? And they, they, they were uh, not working on a relationship with Jesus, and they and they they'll you know now they're going to try and read the Bible, and they're going to they're going to pray, and they're going to go to a church, and they're going to say you know whatever they can think of God, like I want to get closer to you, but this time period will be over, the door will be closed, probation will be closed. The theory of truth, unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit, cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets f the truth right, home, the character will not be transformed. Without enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall away under masterful temptations of Satan. We find out that there is going to be, we, we read in, 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 in the Bible, there is going to be false prophets, and there is going to be signs and wonders and miracles. There's going to be some crazy things that are going to happen. And I believe that if we do not understand who God is, and we're not connected to the scriptures to see things like Jesus' feet will never touch the ground. It says it very clear in the Bible. So if somebody comes and they're on the ground here on earth, right, we won't know them. We also know that, by the way, the Bible is very clear that the seventh day is Sabbath. And so when it comes, if there becomes a time, which I believe there will, we read in Revelation, that you will not be able to buy or sell unless you receive the mark of the beast, unless you reject the commandments of God. And one of those commandments, ultimately, is the Sabbath. And there will be a time coming where the, we will be forced to choose based on a day of worship. And so when we see this, and we know this and preparing for this, and we know that the Bible has told us that there will be a time where we will be needing to make a choice based on the day that we worship. But if we don't know this from the Bible and then everything comes together and, you know, the Pope leads a, a whole thing or, and, you know, the ecumenical movement leads, you know, the, 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 the Protestant leaders say, let's all just come together and get along. And, and we find out even the Muslims are willing to come together on the same day and, 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 and everybody's willing to come together on the same day and worship on this. Then we will be deceived because we think, well, this is a beautiful thing. And we're finally having unity. But are we having harmony or are we having compromise? 
While they went to get oil, the door was shut. The close of probation will happen suddenly. Afterwards, they came and they said, Lord, open to us the door. They came back. But he answered and says, I don't know you. And so what happens? Did they actually go and get oil? Did they get filled with the spirit of a deceiver? And when they come to the door, he would let them in if they had the right spirit. But what if they didn't have the right spirit? Right? So I, I believe this ultimately, that when the close of probation happens, there's, there's no more um, intervention. Right? What I mean by them coming back with oil is what oil did they get? What truth did they get? What spirit is now in them? And I do believe that there will be a counterfeit revival in the end times. We read the saddest of words that have ever fell on mortal ears are those words of doom. I know you not. The fellowship of the spirit which you have slighted could alone make you with the joyous throng at the marriage feast. In that scene, you cannot participate. Its light would fall on blinded eyes, its melody on deaf ears. Its love and joy could awaken no chord of gladness in the world benumbed heart. You are shut out from the heavenly, from the heaven by your own unfitness for its companionship. We find out that those that are not in alignment and don't desire God and don't want to ultimately just be in his presence would find it uh, if they if they want to chase the things of the world they want to be God themselves they're not going to be happy in heaven in Luke 13 26 we read I know not whence ye are depart from me right Luke 13, 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. People will be, it's not about hell. People talk about, oh, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth because you're going to be burned in hell. First off, hell doesn't exist like you think it exists. That is a teaching that is a corruption of the Bible that's not even biblically based. There is no everlasting hell. And so this idea of the weeping and gnashing of teeth is not about because you're, 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 you're in physical pain. It's because you are in emotional torment because you realize you lost out on love. Watch therefore and know neither the day or the hour the Son of Man cometh. And what this means is, is that we need to have our relationship with Christ now. In the last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. They'll have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, and they will turn away. Take each verse of this chapter and read it carefully, especially the last two. And the light of a candle shall shine no more in thee at all. And in the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride shall be heard no more in all in thee. For thy merchants were great men on the earth, for their sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her found the blood of prophets and the saints and all that were slain upon the earth. The parable of the ten virgins given by Christ himself, every specification should be carefully studied. At a time will come when the door will be shut, we are represented either by the wise or the foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say who are the wise and who are the foolish. But, there, but are, um, there are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness and yet uh, outwardly appear like the wise. So there's another, paraphor, another powerful metaphor, and I want to just kind of um, bring this one up as well because I think it's, it's incredibly important, and it's about seeds. Now we read about this um, sower and the seeds, and this is a parable where Jesus is making comparison on our hearts. Matthew 13 speaks of this farmer who is Jesus, and he spreads seeds of gospel. Like a sower in the field, Jesus came to scatter the heavenly grain of truth. Christ, the sower, came to sow seeds of truth. God's word is the sea, is the truth that combats the lies of the destroyer. And the word of God is the seed. 
the soil is our hearts. We are promised in John 5, 24, that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And this is this idea that we are to be soil and how we receive this words, the, the seed, how we receive the seed, um, ultimately will determine um, the fruit that comes forth or not. But there's different types of reactions to this gospel message. The wayside are those that hear but do not fully understand the implications of the gospel and get confused by the deceiver, right? That seed is snatched away, right? The stony ground are those who depend on on self instead of Christ. They trust in good works and in good impulses, but in hard times, they're not tapped into Jesus and there's no roots to trust in Christ to sustain them, right? The roots, there's a little quote here, the roots of the plant strike deep down in the soil and are hidden in sight and nourish the life of a plant. So with a Christian, it is invisible union with the soil, soul with Christ. Through faith, that that spiritual life is nourished. But the stony ground hearers depend on self, not on Christ. They trust in their good works and impulses. The thorns are the cares of the world that choke out the truth. Being too busy with the world, not having time for God, right? The gospel seed is often falls among thorns and noxious weeds. And if there was not a moral transformation in the heart, if old habits and practices in the former life of sin are not left behind, if the attributes of Satan are not expelled from the soil, the wheat crop will be choked out. The thorns will come back and ultimately kill the good, uh, the good seed. Finally, there's the fertile ground and those that are here and understand and they practice the truth. And this is the honest or the good heart, right? These people that the parable is speaking about, um, you know, it's not a heart of sin, right? For the gospel is to preach to the lost. Christ says, I am come not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. He has an, uh, um, you know, an honest heart who yields the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If, he, if, if we confess our guilt, if we feel the need for the mercy of God, if, if we have a sincere desire to know the truth and, and that we want to obey it when we find it, right? A good heart means is it believing, right? It means, it means having faith th- that the word of God is the word of God, right? Without faith, it's impossible to receive. Hebrews eleven six. you know, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Right? And, and, and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Right? We must be born uh, again, but not of corruptible seed, right? but of the incorruptible. And this means that we, we, we need to ultimately um, you know, study the word of God and, and create a space, create fertile ground, um, praying the Holy Spirit for, for us to be used and us to hear and us to understand what God has for us. You know, similar to this concept of the soil, there's one more analogy that, that I'll mention. It's about the wheat and the tares. And in, in this one here is a story, uh, Matthew 13, uh, 24 to 30, how Jesus, again, talking about planting seeds in the world. But we read how the enemy came and planted weeds along with the good seeds. Right? And the question is asked, how will they be able to sort out the good and the bad? And the answer is, let them grow together. Jesus used the analogy of wheat because the tares um, ultimately look very similar. Um, and so when they're being grown, you actually don't know which ones are which um, until they start to bear fruit, right? Until they've developed and until we, similar to like this, right? As we are growing, God, it's hard for outside people, God can, but outside people may not actually know if we are wheat or tares. If we actually are uh, just you know, saying we have a form of godliness, we actually really have a connection with Christ, and so similar to like our characters, until they've developed, until we've chosen who we serve, it's hard to ultimately tell um, what our motivations are or ultimately who we wish to serve. We want to serve God or we want to serve self, right? The wheat are those that seek God and use their resources to help others. The tares are those that chase after this world for themselves, imposing their will on others, ignoring the voice of God and, and, and building on their own self-reliance. There's another really interesting extra detail in the story how the sower went outside the walls to sow. Jesus left his heavenly city to come to earth to sow. Jesus left everything to give us a path out of sin, and we must be willing to surrender to follow him. Finally, last analogy, again, it's about the smallest of seeds, the mustard seed. And in this parable in Matthew 13, 31, we find that um, you know, the mustard seed is the least of all seeds, but when it's grown... It's the greatest, 
right? And this is what faith, that, that seed is faith. So ultimately when we read here is that um, the kingdom of Christ in the beginning seemed humbled and insignificant. Compared with earthly kingdoms, it was the least of all. But in Matthew, we find out that appearance is not what's important. The last will be first and the first will be last. Ultimately, the meek will, seek the, will, will inherit the earth, Matthew 5.5. 5. Every act, every word is a seed that will bear fruit. Every deed of thoughtful kindness or obedience or of self-denial will reproduce itself in others and through them still in others. Now, there are countless uh, lessons, right? Uh, this is just a small, very small sample of the vast stories and lessons that are found in the Bible. Um, I want you to discover them on your own, and I'm excited for you to, to do that. Um, I do highly recommend exploring the parables along the books um, Within Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen White, who provides amazing commentary and insight. Again, I appreciate you taking the time with this. If you haven't taken these courses before, know that this is actually a series of courses, um, both on um, my mentees, which is about you know how to how to find opportunities, how to how to awaken. I have skills training on everything from personal development to um, you know uh, uh, understanding uh, you know pattern matching and 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 and, and uh, human skills, things like this. Right. I also have a whole marketing course that I highly recommend, um, where I've created my own framework on ABCDs of marketing, as well as um, how to start a digital agency, how to be a cloud-based entrepreneur. Of course, the theological series that you're in right now. Uh, the next up is Bible prophecy, which I highly recommend. Um, and I also have more courses even on, uh, speaking of seeds, even on um, uh, homesteading. And so again, highly recommend, uh, just continue with the whole series if you want. Um, but with that, uh, I'll go ahead and leave you here and look forward to seeing you in the next course. Thanks everyone, bye now.